now we are one minute away uh, from our uh, Azure Stack HCI roundtable. Uh, we have some very interesting guests. So Manfred and I, we are on the show, but we are a little bit more moderating the stuff. Maybe we have also some questions, uh, Manfred. Yeah. Um, then we have Dave Kahula. He was yesterday uh, in the show presenting about uh, security. So if you have security related uh, questions, I think that's uh, that would be uh, he would be the right one. We have Jaromir uh, Kasper. He was presenting this morning about uh, MS Lab, uh, the, the script environment where you can do all your demos and test all the scenarios. But I know Jaromir is also very knowledgeable about, about storage bases direct and Azure Stack HCI. We have uh, we have Dave, I have already Helmut Otto. Helmut is from Austria. He had a presentation today about um, small to large uh, Azure Stack HCI deployments and also integrating the Azure services. Uh, Helmut uh, does also the certifications of the nodes, so he's very deep into Azure Stack HCI and Storage Spaces Direct. Uh, I think uh, many questions can be asked here. Um, and then we have two guys from Microsoft. I'm very proud of that. Um, uh, Jeff Woolsey is here. Jeff will have a uh, presentation after the roundtable about what's new in Windows Server 22. Um, looking forward to that, but Jeff also knows a lot of stuff around all the topics we can discuss. Hi, uh, hi Dave. And we have Matt McSpirit. I hope Matt is fit. He just flew in from the US to the UK this morning, but he said uh, he has a session after Jeff, so I hope I hope you are still uh, up to it and not too tired. Uh, um, Matt is uh, in the moment doing AKS, so Azure Kubernetes service, and I'm very interested in the two sessions after Jeff where we have um, an overview of Azure Kubernetes services on premises from Matt, and then a colleague of him, Mike, will, uh, uh, will show us a little bit deeper how the architecture is. So if you have any questions about Kubernetes, but um, uh, Matt was also doing the Azure Stack Hub uh, deployment, and he's also in the Azure Stack Azure Stack HCI team, so um, a lot of knowledge there. And unfortunately, with Teams, we can't do a, a picture of all of you, so we have to switch to the picture when you speak. So um, now we will see if we have questions already for the audience. If you have questions, please ask them in the Q&A part. We, we noticed some question, questions from yesterday, and we have some new questions, but if you have more questions, please ask them. So I will just start or first. Uh, yeah, first I will start uh, with a question. What is the enhancement on Windows Server 2022 HCI? So I think the question is about storage spaces direct in uh, Windows Server 2022. And there is a bit. I don't know, Jeff, if you will talk about that too in your session so we can postpone it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm I am definitely covering um I mean I, I don't I this has been Azure Stack HCI. By the way, greetings everyone. Uh thank you so much for 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 the invite, Carson. Uh I know this has been Azure Stack HCI day, so I I I'm not sure how much or how little 2022 has been discussed yet. Uh I definitely plan on going deep into 2022 um and talking about what's new here. Uh keep in mind that Azure Stack HCI is going to get the the pointiest and all of the uh, all uh, you know the, the the focus of the HCI capabilities as they're coming from Azure and we're moving at a faster pace there. Um, but there are some things that have that have come into 2022 and I'm looking forward to talking about those in my session right after this. So I don't want to I don't want to spoil what I'm what I'm covering. OK, so uh, thanks Jeff. We have already this uh, question and there are a lot of questions around uh, Azure Stack HCI versus Storage Spaces Direct. So I think we will come up with some more here in the roundtable because our audience is very interested about the difference and also why to use, uh, why to choose Azure Stack HCI over Storage Spaces Direct. But we come to that later. Another question is, can I do cluster rolling upgrades uh, uh, to upgrade a Windows Server 2016 storage spaces direct cluster to Windows uh, Server 2022 storage spaces direct cluster. Who wants to take this question, guys? 
show your hand if you want to 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 do it and uh, i we will switch our picture to you <laughs> No, no. As uh, so I, uh, you know, that's an I will take question. It, and I, go ahead, go for it. I, I will think. take it. So, uh, a rolling cluster update you can only do from one operating system to the next one. So you would have to upgrade to twenty nineteen storage spaces, direct Windows Server twenty nineteen, and then you you could. I haven't done it. I know Didier has done it, and Didier is missing here. I think. Yes, he's I, uh, maybe. I can correct you. you can... I think right. You can do replace operating system on one node, and join it back to the cluster, but not with cluster updating, right? So, what you can do with Windows Server 2009? No, you cannot do any Windows Server. You can do just Azure Stack HCI as a feature update to to uh, take it into the newest uh, Azure Stack HCI. The thing you would have to do is probably go one node by node and replace operating system, reconfigure it, and uh, and give it back, right? So you can do, uh, I think, 2016 to 2020, 22 should be possible, uh, but I'm not 100% sure because you can mix clusters. But there's a, I will try to find it on the docs, right? There, there, there's a way that you can do upgrade from two, but I'm not 100% sure if you can mix it. I think. Probably not, you are not probably able to mix it, but what you could do is to make entire cluster offline. I can love it, right, for you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, now you are talking uh, no, no. your head away. I don't know the exact English word. Um, the question was rolling cluster update. Of course, there are other possibilities to get from Windows 20, uh, Windows 2016 to 2022 with offline, but I think the question was more about a rolling cluster update where, while your workload is still running. And as far as I know, but we have Rob later in the session. Uh, he has the last session today. He would be the right guy for that, but he's talking about uh, kernel uh, soft reboot. Um, um, as far as I know, or Dave is showing his hand. He wants to say something. So Dave, we get you here. Yeah, thanks, Carson. Thanks everyone for having me again today. Um, so I, I think one of the things to look at with a double OS skip like that on your upgrades is the life cycle of your hardware that you're having inside of your organization. The reality is, is that most organizations roll with a, you know, a four to five year hardware life cycle. Um, so by the end of, you know, your 2016 cluster, is that really a good target for 2022? Possibly not. You might want to actually be looking at a new CapEx, picking up a new cluster and just going side by side for the migration. Then you can turn the old 2016 cluster, flatten it like Yarmir was saying, and then you can have that for like a DR cluster or something like that. That's typically what I see happening from the field on a double OS skip right now. It's just the hardware, the, the plans for most organizations are four to five years, so. Okay, thanks so far. Let's go to the next session. I was a bit distracted because my my friend Didier can't get into the session, but I I will send him a link a link uh, soon. So the next question um, uh, would be, where can I find a cost comparison between a solution with Azure Stack HCI and Windows Server 2019 for SMB? Uh, it could be helpful to. to to determine the break-even size between the two scenarios, I, I think we are talking about uh, HCI, so doing Windows Server 2019 uh, storage spaces direct versus uh, Azure Stack HCI, um, and the cost is for many people. This is not only the, uh, this is not the only question we had around this, this topic uh, is uh, very important. Be uh, we we had of course a, a fantastic very cheap uh, solution for HCI, uh, Windows Server, with the data center license. You had you had nearly uh, uh, the free uh, HCI stack uh, included in data center if you have VMs. And now with Azure Stack HCI, we have additional costs and uh, we got the question a lot. So is someone there who wants to cover that? I know cost is always something uh, we don't like to talk about. We, we like to talk about features. I don't think I don't know that I don't know that I've seen a, a cost breakdown, and that would be something I would I would uh, push to my my uh, colleagues over in the marketing side. But I would also point out that these are these are two different things now. 
Um, keep in mind that Azure Stack HCI has, you know, built in stretch clustering. It's going to include more capabilities. It's going to include additional features that Windows Server will not. Um, I mean, it, it's, you know, I, I get that the difference between Azure Stack HCI as it as it shipped in 2019 were relatively were relatively there wasn't a huge amount of differentiation. You're going to see more of that going forward um, and as, as we deliver. So I, I understand the cost aspect, but I would also point out that there's, you know, there's other aspects to Azure Stack HCI, such as the native built-in Azure integration, more features coming to Azure Stack HCI. Um, so it's, it's part of the equation, certainly. But as for this specific question, I don't have it. I mean, you could pretty easily do it yourself. It's $10 per core um, with Azure Stack HCI. And, you know, we wanted to, to be consistent um, from a licensing standpoint. Yeah. Um, to add to that, we heard in Helmut session that uh, sometimes Azure Stack HCI is even cheaper than storage spaces direct on the same hardware. El uh, um, Helmut, do you like to elaborate on that? Yeah, it depends on the size of the solution. What we learned is especially for SM, for really small solutions, it's Azure Stack HCI is cheaper and it's going to a no-brainer. Uh, so when we also come down to, to edge solutions and things like that, and like I said in my call in a uh, second thing also, and like uh, Jeff said, it depends on what's the feature set the customer wants. So it's it's not really a, a good idea to just uh, put it side by side and say, okay, that's the one price and that's the other price because you have two different feature sets, two different integration sets for this whole thing. And uh, at the end of the day, um, not comparing the, the, the same things anymore. And when it goes on, uh, HCI will get more and more features and yeah. But one thing to uh, add there as well. Sorry, sorry, carry on. And and for sure, when it comes down to let's say uh, 20, 25 user companies, we have a whole lot of them in the meantime, and yeah, they are happy because they get a real high-end, high available solution for a nice price. True. Yeah. Matt uh, wanted to add something, if I heard correctly. Yeah, and, and one thing to add that, that is often perhaps not not first uh, appreciated as much is the cadence at which uh, the rate of new capabilities comes to Azure Stack HCI versus the traditional Windows Server path. You know, all of our focus at the infrastructure level or the vast majority is focused on bringing that innovation in HCI at a cadence that's much quicker than it has been historically. So we've already had Azure Stack 20 H2, 21 H2 is very close and you know, that sets the precedent for future new capabilities coming in the OS itself, but also the surrounding technologies. Arc, for example, is, is, a, is a perfect uh, way. You know, the, the things we're doing and that you found out about in this uh, in this conference around self-service, around enhancements to monitoring and, and so on and so forth. A lot of those are very going to be exclusive to HCI. So the cadence and the kind of updates that are coming really can enable even the smallest organizations to have big benefits in simplicity of management, new capabilities, efficiencies, storage efficiencies, and more. And can, can we take a moment to talk about cadence? Because I think, Matt, you, you bring up a really excellent point here. Um, cadence is something that we are, 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 have watched very closely. I've been, I've been in I've been at Microsoft now for over 18 years, and I can't tell you how many times we used to talk about cadence like all the time. And the reason why, to be super clear, was customers. Okay, when I first joined Microsoft way, way back in the, the 2003 era, um, customers were screaming going, you're too slow. You're too slow. Everything is taking too long. These Linux guys can shoot out, you know, new kernels, you know, every few weeks and everything's fantastic. Well, it really wasn't. But the point was, Microsoft, you're slow. And we were releasing, you know, every two to three years, like clockwork. And so 2008, 2008 R2, 2012, every two to three years. So finally, we got to 2012 R2 and we said, fine, we're going to do exactly what you asked for. And we released a new version. 2012 R2 came out 11 months later. And I remember sitting in my office and I like pulled out, you know, a huge drink and I was like, folks, we've done it. We finally nailed what customers are asking for. They've been begging and pleading for this. And I cannot tell you the whiplash we got from that. 
2012 R2 was released 11 months and we had no end of escalations at people screaming at us going, I just deployed SQL Server. I just deployed Exchange. I just rolled out a whole set of new applications and you just did this. What are you doing, Microsoft? This is way too fast. But what it taught us was something very, very important, which is now you're seeing come to fruition with Azure Stack HCI Windows Server, which is at the application layer, people want slow and steady. We've learned every two to three years. So I'm about to break and break some brand new news, everybody. The next release of Windows Server will be in two to three years. Okay, you heard it here first. I'm giving you an exclusive, Karsten. You just heard it here. The next re Thank release you. of Windows Server will be in two to three years. Karsten, I'm giving that directly to you, my friend. You are the very first We need first this person. kind of content. Uh, you new can post it on Twitter. Oh my God, <laughs> Jeff from Microsoft just announced the next release of Windows Server after 2022. It's in two to three years, okay? <laughs> Spoiler alert, okay? And by the way, the one after that, will be in two to three years, okay? Okay. If we, go to, if we go faster than that, everybody goes screams. If we go slower than that, then guess what? Th then, then, it, then, then we run into other issues. So we realize that. Now, at the infrastructure layer, the Azure Stack HCI layer, at the storage layer, at the hypervisor layer, things, that's where people want the innovation fast. That's where people are saying, hey, guess what? Uh, we do want these new features. These new processors just came out, and we need to we need to be able to deal with the fact that you know our 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 hardware partners are changing things, and our schedules don't align. Okay, we 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 you know we try to coordinate with the industry, but honestly, things just happen, and so you'll very often see you know a processor release that is not in sync with us, or some new network technology, a new storage technology that's not in sync with us, and so we can't you know two to three years on that part is difficult. So with Azure Stack HCI being an annual cadence, like Matt just said, we 21H2 is right around the corner here. Guess what? This is going to allow us to innovate faster. So the app layer, we're, we're you know, that, that consistent train to keep your stuff uh, on two to three years continues, but the infrastructure layer allows us to go faster and allows us to take the cues from Azure. And we are taking a lot of cues from Azure. Um, in fact, that's part of part of a couple of things I'm going to point out today in my 2022 conversation is there are some things that are, are in 2022 that I don't think people realize have come from Azure as well. Um, and so um, this allows us to really make sure that we're lining up products and, 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 and hitting the right solutions on the right guidance at the right time. As, as a can I jump in there, Jeff? Uh, as of a, as course. A hello, as a, hello. You made it. Yes, as a remark to that, Jeff, I mean, but what, what, what we also see is how slow sometimes people are to upgrade their existing servers to the latest oh, of the greatest. Absolutely. So that means you're also going to have to make it a lot more, let's say, easy for them to upgrade. You, you'll have to have the trust that they want to upgrade because in, in the field, you have these two types of personalities almost. You've got people that are always looking for, uh, let's say, to improve things, to get the latest of the greatest, to indeed make use of that new hardware. But then there is, in my humble opinion, uh, a part of the market that's a bit too big, too large <laughs> for my liking, that stays behind way too long. And yeah. I was wondering, is, is that something that you will be able to address with Azure Stack HCI? Uh, what's the incentive there? Can you, can you dive in there? What what so, what 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 will what will Azure Stack HCI do for the people that today now, let's say, are at least one uh, operating system or probably even more behind? Mm -hmm. No, that's a great question, and I'm going to point at the two layers again. So at the Windows Server layer, at the app layer, we've actually done a bunch of work starting in 2016, 2019. Yeah, I see, or four behind Dave. We'll get to that in a second. 2016, 2019, or 2022. Every release, and I'm going to give huge props to my to my colleague Rob. We have been working on the update functionality of Windows Server um, to make it as easy as possible for people that want to do in place upgrades. And you know, are still you know, you know, a lot of cases, you know, if you you know, it's for a lot of customers, they just want it as the last resort. It's because they installed this application on an OS 15 years ago. They don't have the install media. They don't have the source code. Whatever reason, all they have is an OS running the app, and it's running in a VM. 
And so, yep, we hear you. And so we've done a lot of work to do that, and we're going to continue to do that. And 2022 has done even more work just around fixing and upgrades and all of that. So uh, we're finding about 90% success rate on our upgrades. Thanks, Dave. I'm glad to hear that. Um, so that's definitely that's definitely um, um, you know in line with what we're seeing, and that's that's definitely a, a big improvement from where we were to say 2012 R2 and 2016 back way back in then. And then at the Azure Stack HCI, you know, big part of it is is making sure that the upgrades are just look. These are just feature upgrades. You know, Windows Client has been doing this for a while now. You've been getting feature upgrades. Uh, Windows 10 has had many many feature upgrades. We're getting ready to go to Windows 11, and you know, part of it is making sure that upgrade process is as easy as possible. And we plan on doing that very much with Azure Stack. HCI as well at the infrastructure layer. So yes, we are tackling both of those and we are working to make both of those as easy as possible. Yeah, so let, let me add something and then we have to change the topic because um, I, I, I'm now getting, getting a lot of in the Q&A and it's, it's even too much to read it all, uh, but there are some suggestions uh, if uh, if there could be an inclusion of data center in the Azure Stack HCI pricing i assume even for a higher price other things i heard is for example in azure you have these uh, used in used instances or if you reserved are instances. reserved instances so if you say i want i want this vm for three years because i'm relying on it you get a better price with azure stack hdi not many people build up a cluster for a month and then uh, uh, shut it down and throw the hardware away. So usually it's a long, a long-term commitment to Azure Stack HCI. Let's say five years. So I heard from many customers it would be great if also these re reserved instances would be available on premises for Azure Stack HCI. That would make it much easier. Let's say if we have a reduced price, 50% or whatever for a five or three year commitment, it, it would lower the costs and Microsoft has a benefit. They know this this is coming. Yeah, and uh, it will help a lot of people to move to Azure Stack HCI to lower the pain a bit. What, what would you say? Helmut uh, has the first. Uh, Helmut is first. I just want to add to that that it's also for a lot of customers, especially with big IDs, a sort of a psychological uh, element. So they want to fix the price for the next five years because that's what they are used to and they have to run with the budget. And we have a, a whole lot of questions for sort of reserved instances for Azure Stack HCI because they have a five year budget now that they, like Dave said, the plan their hardware for five years and they know that everything will be new after five years and they just want the security. OK, it's running for five years. We, we do it up front. We finance it, however, do it leasing or whatever. And then uh, uh, after four years, we start planning our next cycle. And that was really, really, we, we see it a, a lot also with our partners like Thomas Grenner so that their customers ask for that. Yeah, and we had several questions uh, that were in this uh, direction. Uh, why do we have in uh, most of the scenarios to do both license Azure Stack HCI and buy Windows Server data center license usually, maybe sometimes standard for our virtual workloads? So several questions were also in this direction. How can we um, have also our VM workload consumed, or is it possible to have the VM workload consumed uh, on a pay per use or prepaid uh, basis via Azure? Yeah. So let's. Uh, there's another question that's uh, that's also interesting, and we had a bit of that yesterday. Um, so with Windows 11, we heard that it requires on hardware TPM support. Um, and we are we are not quite sure about that. We had some discussion. Is that required or not? Yesterday we learned that in Azure Stack HCI we have no support in the moment for the vTPM. So you can't have a virtual machine with a, with a virtual uh, TPM. And uh, that would mean if Windows 11 requires TPM, we really have a problem. We know uh, Jaromir in the moment it's possible with the pre preview build, but we are not sure. Is it a hard requirement for 11 uh, for Windows 11 to have TPM support or not? And if it is, how uh, how would we do that in Azure Stack HCI? Uh, 
Anyone to, uh, am I right with Windows so, 11? So, so there, have been, there have been a bunch of questions that have just flown by and I'm taking a couple notes because I we, we didn't, we kind of went from one topic to the next. So yeah. on, on the data center with Azure Stack HCI, um, I'm not, on, again, I'm not on the marketing side. I'm not in the business side. I don't have anything to do with licensing, but I will tell you this. Um, I know that um, there are some customers that are used to buying their data center licenses. That's the way they do it. That's the way we're doing it forever. And so they're comfortable with it. I also know that there are customers now that we're moving to cloud you know, subscription model that are actually asking for this. So I can tell you that the, the folks that are, that are, that do make these decisions are aware of people wanting to, to be able to license a data center in a subscription way, just like the underlying license. I have nothing to announce. I have nothing to say other than those people are aware about it. They know it, they, they know about it and they're looking at it. So it's definitely a customer request. The one of the other top customer requests I would tell you is what we just got into, which is you know, Windows client on Azure Stack HCI. But the bigger question, the bigger request, and this has been like a, a, a huge, you know, dam breaking, is everybody wants AVD. That's what everybody really wants. Yes. Yeah, and everybody, I've seen, I'm seeing head shaking. That's, that's yes. what everybody at the end of the day wants. Everybody wants AVD. Forget about this whole Windows 11 TPM stuff. They just give me AVD on Azure Stack HCI. I got nothing to announce today, but yeah, we hear you. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, I think I think to I think to add to that uh, to add to that as well, um, Jeff. I think on the on the AVD side, uh, the investments that the Azure team are making in bringing new and exciting options for people to run, for example, Windows 11 in in Azure is absolutely happening. Those teams are working on that, so you can bet your bottom dollar that the investments they're making to enable Windows 11 in the right way to run on Azure, we can learn a lot from from the HCI space. And again, no announcements or anything, but we've, we've heard the feedback and we want to make sure that we're not reinventing things. We want to use what the uh, what's being pioneered in Azure as much as we possibly can and bring it down where appropriate. And uh, just to one final point on the, the licensing side, I know, I know we're getting dragged down a little bit, but it's important, that, as Jeff said, to separate what technically is, is achievable and what business is is achievable and the technology to enable a subscription based windows server to run on hci is probably a lot simpler than than, than what we need to work through from, from the business side so uh, i think there's definitely work to do the feedback keep it coming it's great and we love hearing your scenarios as to why you think one is more important than the other and vice versa because that really does help influence the directions that we can adapt uh, and we can adapt more quickly because of this subscription model that we have in place with HCI. Okay, uh, so um, nice to hear some not announcements, but at least some. I didn't announce anything. Some, yeah, I said nice to hear some not announcements, but uh, we get the, a little bit of a feeling. Yeah, um, feeling. And all feeling, I said yeah. was, all I said was, I hear that you guys really, 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 really want Azure Virtual <laughs> Desktop. Like, like Jeff, for Christmas, that's what I want. I don't want anything exactly. else. Just give me I, AVD on Azure Stack HCI. That would be the best Christmas present ever. That's all I'm saying. That's what I've heard. But I've got nothing. For, yeah, Jeff, and for all who don't know the acronym AVD, it's uh, Azure, Azure Wind Virtual, Virtual, Desktop. Virtual Desktops. Yes. yes. Okay. So another question I, I heard, um, there is a bit uncertainty around. What are your plans regarding uh, Windows Server, uh, where you want to see it? Because uh, we, heard, we hear Hyper-V uh, virtualization storage, that is Azure Stack HCI. And uh, former it was, all, uh, it was Windows Server. Uh, so where is Windows Server heading? Uh, can we answer that here or will you uh, come to in your session about so, uh, that? Absolutely, I'm going to cover this in my session, but let's be super clear here because I keep hearing these rumblings and I want, I'm just, let's cut this right to, right to the chase. If it's in Windows Server right now, it's not going anywhere. I heard someone, I heard some vicious rumor that, oh, we're going to take Hyper-V out of Windows Server. That's not happening, okay? Windows Server is in Hyper-V, period, end of story. Storage space is direct. It's in Windows Server. It's not going anywhere. SDN is there. But the new stuff going forward, because it's coming from Azure, it's coming at a much rapid pace. It's going to change very quickly so we can enable new Azure scenarios 
and new capabilities. Hey, Jeff, I really would like AVD for Christmas on Azure Stack HCI. Those things will go on Azure Stack HCI. Windows Server, yeah, it's got Hyper-V, it's got a storage spaces direct, it's still a fantastic file server, it's still your domain controller, it's still your print server, it's all of those things. Oh, and by the way, it's an application container, it's an application runtime, it's a container runtime, it's for apps. It's always been for apps. What's the number one reason why people deployed servers? Well, it was to run your file server, it was to run domain controllers, it's to run print servers, it's to run SQL, it's to run SharePoint, it's to run Exchange. By the way, yeah, we're seeing a ton of people moving Exchange to the cloud. SQL is exploding everywhere. We are seeing SQL massive adoption on-prem as well as in the cloud. SQL is continuing to expand at a, at a crazy rate in both places. And so we're going to absolutely make sure that Windows Server is a fantastic um, application runtime for all of those things. That doesn't change. That's where it has been for since since its first inception, long before there was anything called, you know, Hyper-V or Storage Spaces Direct or SDN. So I hope that helps. But if it's in Windows Server, we're not taking it out. Mm -hmm. Uh, great. We we had another question. Um, I'm just looking for it. So um, it's it basically as it was uh, when you have uh, virtualization on Windows Server, let's say uh, Windows Server 2019, and you want to move to Azure Stack HCI. We have in the moment uh, kind of a blocker. You can't do that. So customers are ask, why is that? Why can't you move? Uh, from Hyper-V 2019 to Azure Stack HCI uh, 20H2 live migrate or even replicate your VM, it's 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 blocking some or it makes it, let it put it that way, it makes it much harder to move your workload to the new world, yeah, the your new stuff. If you have 100 or even 50 or 500 VMs at customers, it takes a long time because it's an offline process. Yeah. Yes, un unfortunately, um, the migration process, there's there's some additional friction that technically, you know, doesn't have to be there, but unfortunately we have to deal with uh, more than than technically. It's you know what it's 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 business business requirements as well. And from a business requirement standpoint, we cannot live migrate between the two products. It's basically crossing the streams and I'm not going to get into specifically legal reasons, but basically live migration between Windows Server and Azure Stack HCI. There's a reason that's in there and it's basically, it's a business reason. We are working very hard to make sure that we can make that migration process as easy as possible to minimize downtime, but unfortunately, there are some constraints that we have to live with. So hopefully it's a, it's a one-time process. You get them over there and then you're in the new world and everything is fantastic, but I understand that there's friction. Very sorry about that, um, but it's, Honestly, this is an area where kind of our hands are chied from an engineering standpoint and we have to follow business rules. So that's kind of where we're at. We're at. And, and yeah, to add a, oh, go on, go on, Carsten, sorry. No, 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 go on. I, I, was, I was at another question. Go on, uh, Matt. It was just to add a little bit of extra context of, um, of what we've seen, and it is an unfortunate circumstance, but what we've seen uh, many customers have success with is in, in some cases using their backup technologies that they're very familiar with, you know, a backup from, uh, 2019 Hyper-V, a restoration onto uh, Azure Stack HCI. It doesn't negate the in-place changes that you may need to make to roll out HCI onto potentially the same hardware, so there's extra considerations there. But if you were doing a from A to B and both were stood up at the same time, a backup and restoration from, from one platform to the other is, is feasible and in many cases quicker than some of the alternatives out there. We do provide some scripted guidance as well in our docs to move from Hyper-V to Azure Stack HCI, but it does involve an element of downtime. Long term, it wouldn't come as a surprise to anybody that Azure Migrate being our company's focus as, from a migration perspective at both VM and app layers, database and more, is where we're investing our energies to make as rich and as seamless and as automatable and as scalable solution to shift from both alternative hypervisor platforms and legacy hypervisor platforms to Azure Stack HCI. So that's where our focus is uh, is going forward. And I would like to add to this, uh, what I'm planning to do is, uh, as I finished all of these scenarios I was presenting today, the next scenario I would like to focus at is uh, how to migrate from Windows Server to Azure Stack HCI. So 
I have two options or maybe three options that I would like to try with MS Labs. So basically one option will be that you will replace operating system. So basically shut down the host, replace operating system, turn on the host, um, and then import the metadata from the disk. So it will see all the virtual disk. You will just run a script, rename it to correct names and import all the VMs. So this would be one approach and then other approach, uh, either copy item uh, from one cluster to another cluster and then importing it one by one, one machine by one machine. Uh, and then another, maybe I'll try some quick migration or something like that. If it, it, it will work, right? Or maybe I'll just explore it. That what kind of uh, issues you will see if we'll just try it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we had several sim uh, similar questions from the audience regarding SCVMM, so System Center Virtual Machine Manager, and Windows Admin Center. And the 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 question was always, what's the future of both products? Because it seems System Center Virtual Machine Manager is there, but it's not really uh, evolving. We don't have so much new features. Um, and Windows Admin Center is the tool, but in Windows Admin Center, on the other hand, there are some features missing that are in the System Center Virtual Machine Manager. And we got this uh, question in, um, in this in this scenario several times. Can anybody say something about this? What's the roadmap? I think mainly of System Center Virtual Machine Manager and the comparison to Windows Admin Center. I can so, discuss that a bit, if, unless Jeff, unless you want to take some. Matt, you go right ahead. Can you hear me? I yes. I myself yes. back. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, so one way to think about vmm absolutely it's it's still there and and it's been recently updated to support azure stack hci and and that will i think that evolution of supporting newer builds and operating systems will, will continue um that said you also identified that some of the new it's not getting many new capabilities and new features and i think that's a reflection of where customers are looking to change the management approach for managing a modern hybrid infrastructure like Azure Stack HCI. And you'll see a lot of our investments from a management perspective in HCI. Absolutely for local management, Windows Admin Center is getting more and more capabilities, more and more rich extensions. We've recently enhanced more capabilities around SDN. There's obviously been hybrid pieces uh, built in and weaved in, in in terms of onboarding HCI into other Azure services. But where a lot of the focus is going is gelling that with Azure Arc such that uh, deploying new workloads from Arc becomes streamlined and easy, monitoring those clusters, applying updates, uh, policies, all of those things uh, are very much Arc focused. And that's not to say that VMN disappears, but far from it. Again, no announcements or anything, but more specifically, that's where the focus, I think, of leveling the control plane up into the cloud but still bringing Windows Admin Center enhancements in for, for organizations who, who want to have that local like management experience as well. And Jeff, if you've got anything to add there. Yeah, you, you know, and I, I think you nailed it pretty well there, Matt. I think the thing I would add to that is, again, if I go back to what we're hearing from customers right now is people love the fact that they register their Azure Stack HCI and boom, it's there in Azure. And it's like, wow, I didn't need to like <clears throat> do any sort of special magic or any PowerShell scripts. It's just, I click the register button and it's there. And once you start, once you've spoken with a customer who even has a few sites, I mean, it can be as little as, look, I got four sites around the city, but all of a sudden now I'm at home doing remote work and I can actually see all of those different, without actually having to drive to any one of those to actually do the legwork to do this remotely. Boy, I would love to be able to do even more from Azure Stack HCI. Yeah, I'm going to apply policy. I'm going to do setup updates. I'm going to set up monitoring. But boy, you know, I'd like to be able to also, you know, do VM management. I'd be like to be able to create VMs and stuff like that. And so, you know, we are seeing as more and more people get used to con the control plane there, we're starting to see now a, a whole, you know, swath of feature requests for things that we do from the Azure portal. So we're starting to do that. We've also continued our WAC integration, and I have to say it's been awesome. You know, I logged into, I logged into um, the Azure Stack HCI days, and one of the first comments I heard from one of the presenters was, I think it was the, L the Lenovo gentleman was saying, "Look, I know you've seen WAC and you're sick and tired of it." I'm like, "Yes, that is music to my ears." 
you know that that that's been the plan is to make Windows Admin Center ubiquitous, and it's just uh, it's it is it is a it is a standard part of everybody's arsenal, and now it's in the Azure portal, and we're doing we've been integrated in even further, and we've got a lot of exciting stuff coming on with WAC very very soon. You're going to see, um, but it's also to make management easier so that you can better manage your Azure Stack HCI's or your Windows servers from anywhere. And so you know we look at this as having a rich set of tools for you guys to all use so you can be successful managing especially since remote work is is that much more important these days so can i also well, comment on this a little bit um so uh I, you always see all of these three products right you have a windows admin center you have virtual machine manager and now you have arc so virtual machine manager is especially focused on uh, having multiple clusters running solely vms right nothing else because you need to provision VMs. You need to uh, control what VLANs each VM will connect to, what are the subnets, where you have different data centers. So for this, the virtual machine manager is awesome. It's really fast. You can have 1,000 VMs in one VU, but it's only about VMs. While the Windows Admin Center is more or less about one cluster. If you if you ask more customer that has two node cluster or you know two two node cluster, that the Windows Admin Center is is perfect. And then Azure Arc is somehow mixed between these two. It will enable you to consume new Azure services and also hopefully in the future you'll be able to manage at scale, right? With less details focused on a VM. So Virtual Machine Manager will be, be still there for managing the VM's workload. Traditional data center, I would say. And, and the other thing I would add is, is and Windows Admin Center <clears throat> is about helping you what's running inside the guest as well. And so, you know, VMM is managing your VMs, but if I need to get inside there, like I need to configure my file server, or, you know, things like that, whether it's in Azure IaaS or whether it's on my Azure Stack HCI or wherever Windows Admin Center is, wherever your Windows server is, Admin Center can help you manage within the guest as well too. So there's that as well. Yep, and there's still PowerShell, right? So you can do all of this. And absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so just I... more exploring features and then everything else you can do with the PowerShell scale and that's the, the, the tool to, for everyone. Uh, for every IT admin that wants to manage things at scale. What, what so, I would add um, to that, sorry, sorry, Carsten, just to quickly. No, go on, go on, Matt. I, I was. Uh, what I would add to that is if you are using VMM, if you enjoy using VMM and there's a feature that you cannot let go, if there's something you have to have before you potentially transition to Admin Center or Arc or both, let us know. You know, because if there's something that you want, it's probably something that others want as well. So we would love to hear from you and 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 start the ball rolling and potentially bringing that to market in one of the two appropriate solutions as we go forward. We can sync, Matt. I think we can sync together with Artem and all of these guys. Uh, yeah, definitely. There are many so things one, that VMM is great for. Sorry, guys. One one of the biggest asks that I see coming from customers that's kind of sorely missing is that role based access control access to the VMs and driving that down and you know just in time VM access is great but having the ability to have it like that same seamless experience that you have with VMM that's huge for organizations to be able to drill down and say okay this department gets access to these VMs this department gets access to these VMs you can start stop but you can't you can't you know whatever and those those are that's such a huge request every customer i come to has that and so I think as you look at Azure Arc extensions into Azure Stack HCI, other platforms cross cloud and having the ability to control that management plane, that's going to be huge. And when that comes, then I think you're going to see a bigger separation between VMM and uh, and the, the other tools that are available. But that's kind of where customers are stuck with VMM right now. S self service is a critical feature. Yeah. Good to hear. Yes. Absolutely. Hey, hey, Karsten. Carson, I don't mean to hijack this. I know I know where it's 840. Uh, what I, I'm, I'm going to be starting soon, but there's one topic I wanted to bring up real quickly, if I, I could. Do, um, do. And, and this is about saving money. So uh, we were talking about licensing earlier, and I took a note, and I forgot oh, Jeff, to mention wait, this. Wait, 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 Jeff, 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 yes. wait. I, I, let me ask my question, but I, I think it's, it's a perfect answer for that. OK. So my question would be, why should a customer go to Azure Stack HCI? What is, in your opinion, and maybe multiple of you guys can answer, uh, but Jeff first, what is, in your opinion, uh, the advantage over server uh, storage base, uh, storage bases direct in Windows Server 2019? There, there are advantages, and 
I think uh, your your example where you are going to is examples, right? There are a lot of reasons, but I'm going to give you one that everybody is missing. <clears throat> and and I bring this up because Dave actually made a comment about this, how 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 everyone is, you know, a few versions behind, sometimes two, sometimes three, sometimes four versions behind Windows Server. OK, super important point. ESUs. I cannot stress this enough. I've been tweeting about this uh, last few weeks. I have run into multiple customers. I'm not killing, kidding here. They're spending upwards of millions of dollars on ESUs. I want you I want I'm, think about that for just a second. Explain ESU. Paying. ESUs are extended security updates and that's for Windows Server 2008, that's for Windows Server 2008 R2, and we also announced that when 2012 and 22 R2, we are going to make ESUs available as well. If you're running in Azure, Azure property, you get ESUs for 2008, 2008 R2, 2012, 2012 R2 for free. It's all included. If you're running on premises, which a lot of these folks are saying, no, it's really, really old. It's still running on 08, 08 R2, and we're, you know, it's gateway and firewalled and VPN, and it's way behind many, many layers of network defense. So we're going to keep running on our premises because we just haven't gotten around to upgrading yet, but we need support. We need security updates. So they're paying crazy sums of money for this. Here's the thing. Azure Stack HCI includes those ESUs for free. So. If your customer is paying, forget millions of dollars, even hundreds of thousands of dollars or ESUs, there's a very simple question you can ask them. Would you A, like to write a very big check to get ESUs, or B, would you like to call up your partners over at Lenovo or Data On or HPE or Dell or Fujitsu, buy a brand new Azure Stack HCI solution with that same spend, get brand new hardware, and get all the ESUs included for free, okay? This is like an intelligence test, okay? You can get free hardware, or you can run the same stuff on your existing really old stuff uh, and pay for those ESUs. So I cannot stress this enough because I have had so many conversations where the where literally the virtual the conference just stopped, and a director of IT you could see like almost went shades of white because he realized he could have bought like a rack or two of new hardware. And in one case, I ran into a customer that I could have purchased, and I actually spec'd it out for them, four four-node Azure Stack HCI clusters all flash. And they could have retired a whole bunch of ancient hardware. So to me, that is the sleeper feature that nobody is getting, and it's really important. So I just wanted to na nail that. Everybody on the call, make sure you understand that. When a customer says, if you if you see 2008 and 2008 R2 and 2012 in their infrastructure, stop them and say, are you paying for ESUs? Let's get you some free hardware because it can really be a huge benefit. OK, I'm done. I'm off my soapbox I, now. I got one more more question, actually, if, if we have time. One of the discussions we have is like, like I love S2D. I love Azure Stack HCI. I'm really convinced that it's a great solution. But uh, unfortunately, not everybody in the world agrees with me. And some people have other storage needs and they feel a bit left behind. So they're like, either we make that jump and go for that one storage solutions to rule them all, or we are we are getting left behind. So they're struggling a bit with that aspect of the story. Can you can you address this a little bit? So I'm I'm assuming by storage you mean traditional SAN. Or yeah, I, I scuzzy, whatever, 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 whatever. Let's 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 call it everything that is not Azure Stack HEI, right? Let's be, sure. let's be very clear. It, it, it can be it can be convert storage or hybrid convert storage, but it's not Azure Stack HCI. So I, I, I will tell you, and I, I'm, I'd love to hear from you guys about this as well. I, I'm, I'm genuinely curious about this, but the conversations I've had with most customers over the last couple of years has been about retiring those SANs. Um, a lot of people are on old fiber channel SANs or heaven forbid old iSCSI stuff, and they kind of look at it as, that's that thing that those storage guys run that's really, really expensive, that uses their own set of processes, uses their own set of tools, and it's really, really difficult and painful and super expensive. And so we don't want to do that anymore. And so that's predominantly what I hear. Every so often, though, I will run into a very, and it's usually a really large corporation or like a government that will say, look, we've been doing SANS for 20 years and we're just comfortable with it. Okay. OK, well, if you want to do your SANS, OK, then yeah, guess what? Not much has really changed there. 
I mean, we can still take advantage of Fiber Channel. We can still take advantage of iSCSI. And if you want to hook that up to, you know, you know, your servers, you can go right ahead and party on. But at the moment, that's not where our customers are leading us right now. So yes, it's there. The documentation exists. We haven't done anything to deprecate it or remove it or or change it. But at the same time, there hasn't been a tremendous amount of innovation. I mean, we got NICs now, you know, RDMA NICs that are 100, 200, 400, and we're working on terabit Ethernet. And, you know, Fiber Channel's still talking around 1632 and, you know, 64 gigabit and whee, it's super crazy expensive. So, you know, and, and I guess the other the other last thing I would point out is when it comes to storage, you know, the beauty of flash storage and NVMe and Optane and all of these ridiculous things we've been doing with flash storage has been the goal is to move the storage as close as possible to the CPU. And the moment, you know, you start pushing it out, you know, over a fabric or stuff like that, you've kind of shot the performance benefits because now you're limited by the speed of that fabric, where in many cases it can be sitting right next to the processor in the chassis. And so that's one of the really nice things about hyperconverged is the performance, the performance, you know, it, it's it, it's crazy the types of performance you've seen. But again, I'd be curious to know from you guys, are you guys seeing similar um, discussions about, you know, people you know, kind of retiring the old sands and, and that type of thing. And if not, you know, how would you characterize those customers that are still using these large storage um, devices? I can I can I can give you some input because I'm working also with with large enterprises and these guys love their SAN systems. Everything that is not a SAN is not storage. It's uh, it's something to play with, but not for production. So there are there's not in in this type of enterprises the storage guys don't involve a lot they love fiber channel they love sun and they want to retire with it even if they are only 40 yet so uh, not not much innovation there yeah the, the other the other thing i see is that i mean it's not just about the sands and the ice cruises. there are other other storage options out there and some people have heavily invested in that and have moved to that so they modernize but to a different platform let's put it that way and now they have this thing like, yeah, where are we in this? Uh, that's another that's another discussion. So I wouldn't I wouldn't only point to let's say the people that are like I want to. You'll get my sand when you buy it for my cold dead hands. You know, there's there's <laughs> yes. a there's a yeah. different uh, public that has some challenges or explanations to do to their management as to look, we we just made this very nice move to very modern hyperconverged storage, but now we'd like to move to to Azure Stack HCI. Okay. So it's not it's not just the laggers. Let's let's put it that way. I can I can add to that because for for many guys it's scary. The hyperconverged infrastructure is all in one. So you have the same servers for storage for virtualization. You have some demand in network, maybe RDMA. So that's really scary for a lot of people. Before that, they have they had their clear part. So they were doing either virtualization or storage, and you have your network guys. But nowadays, I often see in companies, in bigger ones, if it's not ZAN, they say, oh, it's uh, it's Windows Server. Uh, it, this is now not not a ZAN. That's not our part. Virtualization guys do this networking. We, we also uh, often have a lot of trouble. So the virtualization guys, the Windows guys, they have to do storage as well, and they they are not comfortable with that. So that's that's uh, that's something that is holding back, in my opinion, uh, HCI, and it's not only. Uh, Microsoft HCI, it's HCI everywhere because wow. you have your clear uh, silos or you had your clear silos and now everything is meshed together. And I'll, I'll, the I'll be very clear about that, Carson. Silos are a choice. Even no matter what technology you use, silos are a choice. And you have to pay the price for your choices. And of either you, you get with the program or you don't. And if you don't want to get with the program, you, you could silo up your Azure Stack HCI deployment, right? If you want, if you really want to, you can do that. If that's so if that's want... your major concern, I'm I'm like, you know what? Throw away some of the benefits and go full silo on this thing. You can so, if you want to. I, I wouldn't recommend so, it. Uh, but I want but. to come back to to my initial question before we uh, drifted to this one. Uh, one feature from all of you. Um, why to choose Azure Stack HCI? What is your preferred feature? I heard it from Jeff already. It's the extended use rights. 
So maybe uh, every other one of you has maybe something to add. Why is Azure Stack HCI a good choice over storage basis direct? I, have I know my here, pick, right? but first you. Can I? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, so my favorite one is that you have integrated system. It means that you have support from Microsoft and it will just, you know, we will call it uh, B. <laughs> Microsoft to, sorry, still used to call me, we, Microsoft, sorry, not yet, not anymore. Uh, so you have one point of contact, that's that's the thing. I remember times when um, it was like, no, 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 it's not our fault, it's uh, OEM manufacturer uh, fault. No, 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 OEM told us, no, no, it's a Hyper-V fault. And it was like a ping pong, right? Then I remember issues with the drivers, like com various combination with the SAN. So you had a SAN, it was more or less unique in the world because you have you had some kind of, uh, you know, blades chassis with the blade server, with this and this NIC and with this and that switch. And you had this and that fiber channel card with this and that SAN. And it was so many combinations. So you most likely hit some crazy issue with latencies and it was go, uh, you know, it was ghost and, and mm -hmm. You were not able to troubleshoot it correctly and customers were completely completely lost so your, so your now pick is easy integrate. easy of choice the easy of the support so easy of the support one, one contact. drivers one yeah. pack for the drivers and you, okay. know, you can forget i would add to that so it, because it's it's fitting here i would add to that the cost of support to to get an uh, supported support in an azure stack hci solution it's the azure support and there are fixed prices for that. So for $100 per month, you get your Azure subscription supported and it doesn't matter if there is one uh, Azure Stack HCI cluster in there or five or even more. You get the support for all of them for $100. And if you compare that to the same level support from Microsoft, if you have Windows Server, um, you have to have a support contract uh, because the 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 call the the incident based support will not help you in, in that depth than uh, than the uh, azure support so you have to have a support contract and that is multiple ten thousands of dollars per year so that that's my favorite but other guys please so maybe dave yeah for sure thanks karsten so I would say that my favorite is the direction that we're heading towards the self-service management, the just-in-time VM access, and uh, also the, the security integrations through Azure Arc and Azure Defender. Those are so huge for organizations today because we always talk about standing up the fresh infrastructure and what everything looks like in a sunny day. Nobody ever wants to you know, dive down the rabbit hole of when a threat actor gets into your infrastructure. And so being able to protect that and being proactive on that is absolutely huge. And so having that almost immediately integratable, it's, that's, that's, those are big ones for me. Okay, so we have three minutes left. Helmut, Manfred, you will, you will be last. <laughs> Helmut. <laughs> I would be, uh, I'm totally with Dave, but uh, on a more general purpose so the the whole hybrid story behind it is is the main point so it's it's a whole story about how can i go hybrid uh, keep parts on premise and go to the cloud and uh, everything is is like it's it's in one architecture and okay yeah. so thanks so much so we go to didier then to matt and uh, then uh Helmut will finish and then uh, I think Jeff will start his session. Well, I'm, I'm very much on board with all the, the innovations they're doing to improve on the existing capabilities of S2D. So that's where I want to be. I, I, wa I want to move ahead. So for me, that's that's one of the major reasons to do what uh, to do Azure Stack HCI. Okay, thanks Didier. Matt, I, I, I think I know what, what your favorite is. Well, you might be surprised. I'm, I'm going to be greedy and choose two, actually, because I love GPUs. And I think the work we're doing with GPU uh, in the 21H2, so that's currently well, in preview, well. <laughs> um, that I think is incredibly innovative and opens up new scenarios for organizations at the edge and the data center and so on. So cluster GPUs, moving workloads more flexibly and, and taking advantage of that. The other one, which I think is cool, What's the hardest thing that people struggle with setting up uh, infrastructure in the data center? It's networking. So the network ATC stuff that's coming in around really using a more declarative 
approach to defining the network uh, is, I think, a, a game changer is overused, but I think it's it's incredibly uh, important. So I was betting, and Manfred, I think, the, was doing the same. We uh, we are betting on AKS on HCI, <laughs> but well, yeah, that's also. Awesome I love well. your other answer. Think. So Manfred, yeah. <laughs> so you have still your favorite? It will be the last one, yes, but yeah. Yeah, because I don't want to steal your one. No, no, I have. So, I say I have said my ah, support okay. because I support lost my bet about you because I would have said your favorite is stretch clustering. Because it's also a great oh, there is something but, like that. But my one is uh, my one is the as a service concept. So for me, I think it's really great to have Azure Stack HCI um, as an as a service concept. So we have the pay per use model, and we receive the new version, so we can ensure that the customer is always enabled to use the latest technology. So this is my favorite. And I have to add a stretch cluster, of course. Yeah. It's all I'm doing with Azure Stack HD, you know, I know. Okay, thanks guys so much. And uh, excuse to the audience, I couldn't keep up with the questions and I was seeing that some questions were asked, uh, answered in this chat by the speakers. So thanks so much for doing this, guys. It was, uh, it, it was great having so much opinions and so much knowledge here.